lesson today is the kingdom's preeminence. And, and so we're going to focus probably on four scriptures that we want to dig into. And so I always, I always just let you know as Sabbath schools, we jump into the word, grab your water, your coffee, your tea, and we're just going to spend some time making sure we go through the scripture. Hopefully you have your Bibles with you as we dig into the word of God. The introduction, from the onset of his ministry, it is undeniable that Jesus put a premium on the kingdom of God, fervently urging its preeminence in the lives of mankind. Jesus made statements that offended many individuals, and even today, some are offended. But it was foretold he would be a rock of offense, a stone of stumbling, and many would fall and be broken. This lesson shows the kingdom of God must be paramount above all that men hold dear in this present world. Memory verse, Matthew 11 and 6, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Biblical application. How important is gaining entrance into the kingdom? Jesus says, if your hand or your foot offends you, cut it off. If your eyes offend you, pluck it out. For it is better one enter into the kingdom crippled or blind than be cast into the lake of fire. Sound extreme? But the context of such an illustration wasn't that absurd in ancient times. It aims, it aims is to incite a, sense, incite a sense of urgency. Such a statement is not to be taken in the literal sense, of course. The technical term for such an expression is called hyperbole, an over-the-top statement to exaggerate a point. It is like a parent who says to a child, if you do that again, I'm going to skin you alive. The child knows their parent is speaking figuratively. Nonetheless, they get the seriousness of the matter. Jesus tells a rich young man, go sell all and come and follow me. Is Jesus asking too much? One man asked to bury a family member before following him. And Jesus replies, let the dead bury the dead. Is this going too far? Jesus stressed the importance of gaining entrance in the kingdom at all costs, even over our most valued possessions, such as family, social status, earthly possessions, and yes, even more valuable than the loss of a hand or foot. We must be wholly sold out for the hope of gaining eternal life. So as we look at the, the breakdown, it says Christ, a rock of offense, and then we must forsake all. So if you would, we're going to jump actually into Luke chapter four. We're going to look at verse 17 through 28. And as we jump into the word of God, I just want to give you just some background on Luke. Um, you know, I always say this is one of the things I would ask is, is we study God's word. I really want to make sure that you understand who the author of the book is, because I think that tells you a lot about their perspective on how they are writing the gospel. So, uh, in, in my message, in my learning notes, did you know Luke's own introduction to his gospel, uh, indicates that he composed the letter with the purpose of providing a very careful rendering of the events of Christ's life in a chronological order. Luke was a physician, uh, so he would have been trained as a careful observer, a quality that would have been invaluable in his project. The result was the first part of a two-volume book written to Theophilus. We know the subsequent volume as the book of Acts. Paul lists Luke as one of the Gentiles in his greetings in Colossians chapter 4, uh, verse 14, the ancient prologue goes on to state that Luke eventually settled in Greek city, the Greek city of uh, Thebes, where he died at the age of 84 years old. So if you study the book of Luke, you will notice Luke's book has more miracles or healings than any of the gospels. Why? Wow, Luke's a doctor, so he's pinpoints. He looks at these things. Look, Luke's book gives a very chronological order of Jesus life. And so as we jump into the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4 verse 17 through 28, we want to just find out what is it that Jesus is really trying to get across in this message and in this text. So, Luke chapter 4 verse 17 through 28 from the Message Bible. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said to them, no doubt you will quote the proverb to me, doctor, heal yourself. So all were heard that took place. So all heard what took place in Capernaum. 
do here in your hometown also. He also said, I assure you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's day when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, while a great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to the widow of Zarephath in Sidon. And in the prophet Elisha's time, there were many in Israel who had serious skin diseases, yet not one of them was healed, only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. So, Apostle, as I was studying this lesson, I, I looked at this scripture before, but really had never gone this deep into it from the standpoint of, when I look at this, what do you think was offending this audience? So we, we know that Jesus is talking to this crowd, and he really just says, you know what? A prophet's never going to be accepted in his own town. But I go to the first point. They simply say, isn't this Joseph's son? And I highlighted that. So, Apostle, as you hear this scripture, what comes to your mind as we think about, man, why is this passage of scripture so important? One of the biggest problems that we have as people is to see the God in other people. To see, and that's what Jesus was saying. Yeah, y'all know me. I've been around here 30 plus years. Y'all know who I am. You know my father. You know what I did uh, in the um, as a livelihood, but you don't know me. And I think that's what happened to us today. When God moves upon somebody's life and begin to work with them and, and call them out, that's what God did. That, um, I mean, with Jesus, Jesus came for purpose. But one of the things that we fail to recognize is that God calls people out, out of a family, you know, out of a city. But he'll call somebody out and establish them in a way that, the average person in that city is not established and they have a hard time trying to understand why. Why did God choose them? They're, they're, they're no different than we are. That's God. And we miss so many learning opportunities. We miss so many blessings. We miss so much of what God um, would do for us mm -hmm. because we have a hard time accepting the people that God is doing it through. It, so, Apostle, one of the things I looked at as, as I was looking at Luke chapter 4 is the, the previous scripture talks about Jesus is actually attempted of the devil, and then he actually begins uh, having this conversation uh, with this crowd, and they say, isn't this Joseph's son? So I love the point that you brought out that they're, they're like, hey, we know who you are. We know we've seen you grow up. And then he makes, I think, a very interesting statement where he says, you know what? Y'all are going to say, um, we heard what you did in Capernaum, yeah. um, do it here in your hometown. So why aren't you performing the same type of miracles? And G Jesus then gives two examples of when the famine happened, um, Elijah actually went to the widow of Zarephath. And then when um, there were other people around Elijah, the prophet, but it was naming a Syrian that was healed. So do you think, Apostle, we can miss getting our blessing if we don't actually recognize the anointing in someone, maybe like people in, in this scripture that Jesus is pointing out? Could a person miss their blessing because they see the natural, but they don't see the spiritual in a person? And the other fallacy, and that's very true, but the other fallacy is this. Two people can come in with the exact same condition. Mm. and they come before the man or woman of God, and they do what the scripture said, you know, in a sick among you, call upon the elders of the church. They go through all of that. One of them received healing, and the other does not. And people, unfortunately, have a way of thinking that that is some weakness in the individual. But when we recognize that we only operate on the power of God, we are not healing the individual. Mm -hmm. We are not doing these things. These things are, are being done through the power of God. And he's the one that makes the determination. 
um, when when the prophet came to um, Hezekiah and said, set your house in order, you're going to die. You know, this was, the prophet could have laid hands on him and asked the Lord to, to heal him. But he left. He, made, he gave the message. He didn't say that um, I came here to, the Lord did not send me here to heal you. He sent me here to give you a notification of your death. And then that's the thing that don't look at a person's track record. Um, well, you know, other folks have come to them and they didn't get healed. All we do is follow the instructions. The healing or whatever else it is comes from God, and we have to recognize that. Okay. So, Apostle, I'm going to say this, and then I'll open it up to the class. One of the things, as I've studied this scripture, what Jesus said enraged his audience. And it says in verse 28, when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. And then from that anger, they began to take action. They got up. They drove him out of town and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on. And their intent was to hurl him over the cliff. So the Sabbath school lesson talks about being a rock of offense. So as I look at this scripture, there may be times I hear a preach word. I may hear in the scripture, or someone may say something to me that, that really offends me. It angers me. It upsets me. And, and, and the thing that I, I wanted to just discuss with you in the Sabbath school, how should I respond when I, when I hear a word that I don't agree with? Good question. The first thing, and let me just say, go back to that action. The problem they had was they felt, they were, they were offended mm -hmm. because these were religious people. They were offended because they thought he was taking authority in an area he had no authority. Okay. Now, of course, that, that's what the, the, the offense was. But then your question is, <laughs> if I hear a word and I'm offended by that word, or I disagree with that word, the first thing I need to do uh, is to say that, does this word line up with the scriptures? Okay. If somebody coming from left field and that word don't line up with the scripture, I don't have to accept that. But if it lines up with the scriptures, then my next approach is go before the Lord. Lord, I'm having a hard time receiving um, this word. God is not going to leave his people in the dark. Okay. He's not going to leave in the dark. So he would tell you, he would give you understanding. If not immediately, just wait on him. And he would give you the understanding as to why, um, whether or not it was him speaking. Okay. So what I heard you say with this is, if the word offends me, um, I've got to first ask, does it line up with the scripture? And that's why it's so important that we know God's word. And then I need to see God. Hey, I'm having a hard time receiving this word. Help me do, help me uh, put myself in a posture where I can receive the word of God. So before we move on from this scripture, we just want to open it up to the Sabbath school. Any comments or questions around this, this passage of scripture? I don't, um, I do have a question. I don't know if you will get to this particular um um, scripture, but it's in the same, um, around the same conversation we're having now, and that is rock of offense, because you, you think of rock of offense, you think of a transgression, somebody's breaking the law, or somebody's doing something wrong, so how is Jesus a rock of offense? Okay, so how, I, I open it up to the Sabbath school, I think that's a great question, how is Jesus a rock of offense? Because he taught what they were that was against them. They couldn't accept him. You know, they, they were waiting for the Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah. But you're not, we are offended by you taking on um, the character or the position and, let, and telling us that you are the Messiah. They had an issue with Jesus being the Messiah from his birth. You know, even, even, um, those that came to him, they asked the question, are you the one or should we look for another? Because if you're not the one, we're offended by you saying this. So he was, he was a rock, right? But he was also the rock on fence because they were coming to him like, uh, we can't see this. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to so many people. They're offended because of what they can't see. 
Yeah, Apostle, I think that's a, a great explanation. A any other comments? And, and St. Charmaine, thank you for that question. Any other comments or thoughts? All right, if not, go with me. We're going to spend a lot of time in Luke. Go to Luke chapter 14, and we're going to spend some time. And if you looked at the learning notes, I, I want to just spend some time analyzing this particular scripture. Um, I want to just spend some time looking at this scripture. So it's Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 33. I'm going to read the scripture, and then we're just going to spend some time going through it to analyze it. And there, there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and cannot come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficed to finish it, lest haply after he have laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first, and consulted whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desired conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever be he of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, Wherefore shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dung hill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So I wanted to spend some time on this scripture. And again, saints, I think it's really important. So let's go to verse 25. And I just want to break, I want us to break this down. And it says, and there went a great multitude with him. So he had a large crowd following him, and he says something. He turns and he says, all right, I want you to understand. If you're going to come to me, he says, you got to hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brother, your sister, and your own life. And then he says, apostle, if you don't do that, you cannot be my disciple. So I want you to just to make a note. The word disciple actually means learner or pupil or student. So he's saying if you can't be one of my learners, you can't be a student of mine, you truly can't be a follower of mine unless you're able to hate. And again, this gets back to that hyperbole, but he, he, he gives them a distinction. You've got to begin to put this relationship above all others. So apostle, as you read that scripture, what comes to your mind and what is the message Jesus is trying to get across not only to this audience, but also to me today as a believer. You know, you, you kind of highlighted the most important word in that, um, in that verse. The word is hate. Mm -hmm. And the word hate goes against everything that Jesus taught. Think right. about it. Everything that Jesus taught, the word hate goes against it. He teaches us to love, to love, to love family, love your wife, husband, love your wives. And this scripture, he's saying what? Hate. You, you got to hate. Now, wait a minute. That's like an like oxymoron or something that just doesn't make sense. So when you're reading this, this verse here, hate, this the term you're talking about the hyperbole is that it's so strong that your feeling towards following Christ have to be so intense as much as you love family and, the, and especially key players in family that he spoke of in this verse. It has to be almost like a hate relationship because you, are, you will choose Christ over anyone in your family. Mm -hmm. You will choose Christ. And, and, and you know, and many of you all that are on um, this, this conversation right now have been through that. You had to go through a process that, if, that even to the family, they thought you hated them. Right, right. You know, you mean you're not going to do this? You can't do this? You're not this? And they took it to be hatred. 
wow, after all we've done for you and you almost look like you're turning your back on us. And when they, when they share with one another, it comes across as if, as if they are saying to each other, boy, she hate us. Right. He, he must really hate us. But that's not um, hate in the sense of that, that this lack or lack of love. It means that to follow Christ, it has to appear to your family as you hate them until they got to really understand who you are in Christ. Yes, yeah, so Apostle. And again, I want to open it up to the class. I want us to think about our, our lesson is the kingdom's preeminence. And really what we're what this lesson is entitled about is how do we ensure that we make sure Christ is our number one priority? It's all about the kingdom. It's all about Jesus Christ. And so as I think about what Jesus is saying right here, he's really saying, you know what, my relationship and, and with Jesus and Jesus is stressing your relationship with me has to be the number one relationship. It has to be the most important relationship. It has to be the top priority because if it's not the top priority, he really says you cannot be my disciple. So I want to open it up to the Sabbath school. Any thoughts, comments, or questions around that first portion of scripture? Yes, Deacon Preston, how you doing this morning? Hey, Happy I'm Sabbath. doing well, and you? But my thing with that hate word is that he didn't, the word hate, like Pastor um, Raglan is saying, is, is, is not about the part of, of, of the love for his family, it's the part of, he didn't want his family to convince them that the word that Jesus was saying wasn't true. In the sense of his family, that their family or their sisters or, or whoever trying to convince them that what Jesus was talking about is not true. You know, Jesus said that in the point of hate, you, you got to not listen to them because I am the truth. I am the word. I am the light to to listen to me, to to, to, to come into to, to my father's kingdom. Okay. If, I, if, I if you get that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Sister Monica says we must love Christ above everyone else. And I think the reality, that's easy to say with our lips. It is easy to say, man, I love Christ above everything else. But when you think about, I always say this, I tell people, um, show me your calendar and I can show you where you spend your time. Show me your checkbook. I can show you where you spend your money. The reality is, how do I know Christ is your top priority? What are some of the things that if you, if you're examining your own life, how, how can you say Christ is my top priority? And I think that's, that's the check that we have to make as believers. Is Christ truly my top priority? Uh, do I have time dedicated to spend with Christ? Am I spending time in God's word? Am I seeking God's face? Because he really says to them, you can't be my disciple. And then in the next verse, and this is really important as we look at this next verse, Jesus says something that to this crowd would have actually shocked them. In verse 27, he says this, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And so the reason I think this is important to the audience that Jesus was talking to, they were under Roman occupation. They, they would have seen crucifixions. They would have seen, now in a Roman crucifixion, you had to actually carry your cross beam to wherever you were being executed. So the, this people would have seen it. And it's ironic, Jesus is going to die on the cross. And he says to them, you know what? If you're really serious about following me, if you're really serious about being my disciple, then there, there's a cost to this being, coming in this walk with me. I'll share this and then I'll open it up. Uh, I shared with many of you before, I listened to um, Chip Ingram and his ministry. And, I, and, and he shared an example this week that he was doing some teaching in the Middle East. And before they let the class go, he had some people come to him because they said, you know, we're going to take this teaching back and we know we're going to die. And I, I, and the lady asked him, she said, uh, Pastor Ingram, can you teach me to die well? And I was like, wow. And, and Chip Ingram said it just really shocked him because he's like, in this American version of Christianity, we really don't think about what we have to give up. Like, would I be really willing to give up my life? 
But there are places in China, there are places in Yemen, there are places in foreign lands where people who are bringing forth the gospel are actually knowing they're going to lose their life for the gospel. So as we look at the scripture in verse 27, he says, uh, you've got to bear your cross. And, and if you don't, you can't be my disciple. So apostle, any thoughts on that? And then I'll open up to the class for any thoughts to discuss. One thing I want to touch on when you talk about um, uh, giving up pretty much family, what not for sake of Christ, not giving up, but uh -huh. uh, Christ has to have preeminence over family. This is the thing. Sometimes they hear this well. We confuse church with Christ. Mm. Think about it. We make decisions about church. And we, because the church wants us to do this, or the church, the church, this is not saying the church. This is saying Christ. So sometimes we give up things, and we can do that, because the church encourages us to do this. But what this scripture is talking about following Christ, mm. not so much following the church. And a lot of people um, did not have, handle family well because of church and not Christ. But well, can we unpack that a little bit? I want to unpack that because you said uh, we confuse church with Christ, but I'm in church to learn about Christ. And if you've taught me something that Christ has asked me to do, I see the church in Christ as being the same. The church is the bride of Christ. Okay. But I'm, when I said the church, I'm talking about the church. Is, I'm not talking about the body of Christ. I'm talking about the church organization. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. Because organizations say, you know, do this, don't do that. Da, 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 da. We got a whole lot of little things that we do. And a lot of times, we make those things over uh, over family when they don't have to be, as long as it's not offensive to Christ. But if that's what I if that's the teaching, then I'm going to follow the teaching because the teaching is supposed to align with the Word of God, right? But see, the thing here is sometimes our teaching is a part of ordinances and a part of things things. Not teaching so much of what God said, do you know, the do, do's and don'ts of the, of the word of God, it's the do's and don'ts of the of an organization, do's and don'ts, because every uh, structured religion, every structured organ, any, any organization, whether it's a secular organization or whether it's a religious organization, they have things, and we have to rightly divide, we have to um, look at things versus um, church. And I know that's a whole big yeah, that, uh, <laughs> can that I'm opening, and probably this lesson is not going to afford the time to get into that. But, um, you know, the thing is, I'm following Christ. I'm following the teachings of Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm following the commands of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, where we often th think about it, a lot of times the commands of the church override the commands of what Christ have. If we if we that we really get into it, you know, sometimes things that we cited that oh the church said the church said the church said what are we really saying? We're really saying that um, the ordinance of, of this, and I think that's where flexibility have to come into play, because uh, when it comes to family, mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, I have forsaken family, right? I have given up family. For, to follow Christ, mm. to follow Christ. Sometimes yeah. we take it a step further. We give up family to follow a church. Well, Apostle, I'm going to open this up to the class because you're right. I wrote that down. That's probably a Friday night Bible study, and I wish yeah, you would have yeah. told. I wish you would have told me this 25 years ago. But my. <laughs> But, but Amen. I mean, I, I, I'm, being, I'm being honest, right? Amen. If you're honest school, Amen. The reality is when you're taught, and, and, and again, I'm talking from experience, when you truly sell out to this thing, right. and you sell out to, man, this is what we teach, and you're all in 100, without the clarity that you just gave, you have people who in their belief that they're following Christ, Christ is still saying they're following the church 
because they've not distinguished between, between statutes and ordinances of the church and what is following Christ. Let, let me, for me, and I'm just saying this as the teacher, I think we have to do a job of, and you said flexibility, but also saying, all right, this is a church ordinance, but this is what Christ is saying. And I always have to make sure Christ is preeminent. Christ is the first thing. The church ordinances are, are good, but the ordinance is not the thing that I'm following as far as being preeminent. But again, um, if you, we're going to have to unpack were, that one in a Bible study. And I, yeah, let me just say this. If you were in Idaho. Right. Right today. Right. Yep. You're in Idaho. I don't know about House of God Church there. I mean, I'm sure it's a Sabbath keeping church there. But what is today? It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath day. Yep. So if you were in Virginia, as you are, versus being in Idaho, what's the difference between them being the Sabbath? It's the Sabbath where? In all your dwellings. In all of your dwellings. See what I'm saying? That's right. That's the piece that we, that those are the little things I'm talking about. If I know it's the Sabbath, wherever, I, and this pandemic is teaching us that, and we didn't know it before, it's the Sabbath wherever we are. So sometimes, you know, we had this thing about um, the church, the church, the church, but I'm the church. Mm. I'm the church. And so if I'm the church, if I'm in Idaho, I don't know, in Boise, Idaho, that might be a Sabbath church, might not be. And you've experienced it, Deacon Preston, when you've been in Illinois, you have to go two hours. That's right. To get to a church, right? The church that we know of as a Sabbath keeping church the way we do it. But those Sabbaths that you don't go, what you do? Keep the Sabbath. You keep your Sabbath. That's right. See what I'm saying? So my point is, we have made certain things to be about uh, following Christ when they're really about following the church. Wow. Hey, we're, we're definitely, I, I'm making some notes because we're going to have to unpack this one. Um, because uh, again, and I'm not going to belabor the point, and I want to open it up because I think apostle, and I appreciate what you said, because as I'm studying this lesson, what Jesus is saying, I want you to understand and count the cost of following me. The, the cost piece is following Jesus and becoming my disciple. So I'm, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to open it up to the Sabbath school. Any comments or questions? Because Apostle just threw, uh, he threw a big one out there. So any comments or questions? Yeah, that's a hand grenade. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my you Lord. The class. <laughs> yeah, you, and the reason I say that is because I have grown up um, in the house of God all my life and to hear but that's not, that isn't the first time I've heard um, that approach to church and what the Lord is saying. And I want to use an example. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it won't, I, and I'm not trying to cause any ruckus, but I want to use an example. Um, okay, so we don't believe in Christmas. We don't. But because of, um, and I'll use myself, because of the way I came up, um, with the understanding of what Christmas is, what Christ says about it, so on and so forth, I isolated myself from my family. Right. When in fact, I still um, could take a stand for God and sh still show the love of God towards my family. Yeah. Even though we didn't believe the same thing, but there were moments, and I'm just using Christmas for an example, but there are moments that I could have demonstrated differently um, had I thought differently without taking that aggressive approach with um, church, um, the, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Uh, yes, all of that has toned down now. Uh, you probably can tell. A lot of that has toned down now, but I, I go at it differently now. Very well, much like just said. Trying, let me share this with you. Uh, the, the, the Ross twins, right? I don't know if they're on the day or not, but they asked me a couple of years ago. Now, those young men have a beautiful family. Their, their parents would do anything for them, has been supportive. Mom wanted everybody at the house for Christmas dinner. And they're struggling. They're saying, what do we do? You know, we have we we don't practice the uh, Christmas aspect, but um, you know, I'm not celebrating Christmas. But mom and dad want us there um, for with them, 
I ask one question. Do you plan to eat dinner the 25th of December? <laughs> they say, yeah. You know, no more. Yes. Than that. I, mean, I hope they all. They, go, yeah. they say, yeah. yeah. I, said, well, I said, so where are you going? You're going to your mother's house to eat dinner. Mm. That's your mentality. Whatever they are doing, whatever, what reason they are there, you are going to eat dinner. And sometimes, I mean, that's, I know, listen, when I said this thing, I know this is a stretch. But I think one of the, well, there was a control element when it came to church over the years. There they was, they was, they has always been a control element. If you don't keep the folks in line, they subject to do anything. People, people concerned them and fearful of membership. And a lot of uh, things they factor into that. Jesus was accused of eating and drinking with whom? Yeah. Sinners. Yeah. That didn't stop him from going around them. Right. We'll talk more about it one day. Yeah, you know, Apostle, I appreciate that because, again, I've made that note. Uh, we confuse church with Christ. And I do think we, we, we need to make sure that we unpack that because I think... Uh, again, not an indictment of any prior teaching. It was as, as we, as Apostle Randolph Ragland used to say, as the light gets brighter and brighter. Right. So as yeah. the light gets brighter and brighter. And so there's some things that in one dispensation, yes. it, we held firm to it. But as the light gets brighter and brighter, we get to this point where this is about following Christ. Yes. And this is about a Christ yeah. being preeminent and being paramount in our life. So I appreciate and that. Rag, but, uh, encourage us to do. That's right. So when you, you know, study, learn more. You know, every teacher, every leader gives to the people what God gave them. Now, if, if he taught 40 years ago, what I'm saying now, he'd probably been excommunicated. <laughs> he would have been. Probably. You yeah. know, uh, again, good point, Apostle. I appreciate you you bringing that out, you threw the hand grenade in and, and duck. So I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to open it up to anyone else who has comments or questions. Because I know people got questions, but any other comments before we continue to go through this scripture? You know, uh, Apostle, Apostle touched on this back in uh in September, about not to confuse organization of the church teaching with Bible teaching. Yeah, I, and Brother John, I think that's such a good point is, and I've been in a lot of churches, every church has church rules and ordinances. That's right. Every, yeah. every church from the Baptist, the Methodist, the Catholic, every church has church ordinances we have yeah. to make sure we follow Christ. We have to yeah. make sure we understand. That's why I'm a big believer in studying God's word. So if I study God's word, God's word is the thing that we want to make sure that we have in our hearts, in our minds, that we obey God's word. Now, when I become a member of the church, uh, I'm a member of the house of God. So because I've given my allegiance to the house of God from the standpoint of joining that church, I'm expected to follow those rules and ordinances, but I've made a choice to become a part of the organization, the house of God. Okay. So yeah. uh, sister yeah. Laverne said, don't let the light get so bright that it blinds you. Well said sister Laverne. <laughs> All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. If not, I just want to, just break down these. Jesus gives two examples I think are really important in this scripture. He says, you know what? And he's really tying it back to making sure as a follower of Christ, you count the cost. And I think it's really good. As I'm watching Jesus talk to people who want to join him, he lets them know there's a price you're going to pay for following me. And I want you yeah. to count the cost. So he uses this first example. If you build a tower, have you counted the cost? Can you finish it? Because he's basically saying you don't want to start it if you can't finish it. And then he says, if you're going to go in the war, do you have what it takes to win the war so you don't have to surrender? And I think a lot of times as I looked at that the scripture, Jesus always gives us a choice on whether or not to follow or not follow. 
It's not like he's forcing anyone to follow him. And he tells these individuals, hey, this is a great multitude I'm talking to. I want to make sure you count the cost before you sign up to follow me. So any comments or questions before we get to our next scripture? All right. If not, go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And verse 28 through 30. And well, what up? Let me read. Let me read. I'm going to start at verse 18 to just give context. So Luke chapter 18, verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I I kept from my youth up. Now, when Jesus, when, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven and come follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they, they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, who then can be saved? And he said, these things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that have left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. And so I just want to stop right there as we go through this scripture and we think about um, the kingdom's preeminence. And so, Apostle, as I was looking at this scripture in verse 28, Peter stands up. And again, you know, Peter's one of my favorite in the scripture. He says, we have left all. And I think about that. And, and, and he said, and follow thee. So Peter and this, this group, have they really left all. And he's like, man, we've left our houses. We've left our parents. We left everything. And so, Apostle, when we think about that commitment to following Jesus Christ, what stands out to you the most as you hear Peter say, we've left everything? You know, um, this is what stands out to me. As you were reading earlier, this rich uh, young ruler, uh -huh. think about it. He said, I have done church all my life. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. He said, when they went down and listened to the commandments, he said, I've kept those from my youth up. But he said, you got to sell what you have uh, to follow me. You know, but I've done church. But he's, but Jesus was letting them know, but you're not following me. Right. And to follow me, you have to do this. And then that's what Peter come in and said, but we have done that. We have given up all. But this is what I, two things I take note. Anybody, I'm going to have a, to phrase this, anybody who, um, did not grow up in this thing, did not grow up in this knowledge um, and come to it, you have a twofold blessing. You are blessed now. That's what I would do. The last version you read, yep. for, um, where he said, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time? He said, because you left what you were doing, because you came and followed me, you are getting more now. In this present time, and not only uh, are you getting more in this present time, when your income, guess what? Mm. You got life everlasting. You got a double blessing. For those for those of us who, Sashami talked about earlier, been in this thing all of our lives, we're blessed. We got eternal life. But the one who come into it, they are promised 
a greater blessing in this present time. Yeah. The day they're living in. In addition to that, you're going to get life everlasting. Because he know to, to leave family, to leave friends, I mean, to leave loved ones mm -hmm. in the categories we spelled out earlier, to fa our mother, father, sister, brother, to leave all of that is, is a, a way of showing that, you know what, Christ is my all in all. Mm -hmm. And because I made him my all in all, Christ is saying that you're going to not, you're not going to be able to say that you did more for me than I did for you. So I'm going to bless you abundantly in this present time. And when your life here is no longer, I got a reward for you in the end. Amen. I think that's a great point, Apostle. So I want to just ask this to the Sabbath school. Uh, when we hear Peter's comment, we have left all. How do we show that we're fully committed to Christ today? What are some examples of how, how do I show that I'm fully committed? Because Peter's all in. You know, Peter and the disciples are all in to following Jesus. So how do I show that today? You know, you know, Peter says that here, but when you get farther on into Christ's ministry and they arrest Jesus, he's trying to save his own neck. So he hasn't really left all yet. It appears. Uh, that was just something I saw when you read that. But yeah. You, you. Yeah, so Brother John, you're right. Right here, Peter says we've left all, but it's not until after the day of Pentecost. So I did some additional study on Peter. Um, a lot of times what people don't recognize, so Peter is married. We know Peter's married because Jesus heals his mother-in-law. Um, but when P after Jesus' resurrection and Peter starts the church, after the church goes through persecution, so if you go to Acts chapter 5 and you read the book of Acts, Peter actually becomes a fugitive. He becomes a pastor on the run to where when even when Luke is writing about Peter's escape from jail, he doesn't share where Peter goes. And historians are saying it's because Peter was on the run because there were people who were looking after James had been killed. They were people who were saying, if we can kill Peter, then we can actually do some damage to the church. So I think it's really important. And I love that point. At this point, Peter was like, we've given up all, but he hadn't. But later on, after the resurrection, he actually does give up everything. And history says he was actually um, crucified upside down for the faith. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I want to touch on some points. Brother Michael brought something up. He says, making meaningful time to spend with God and then he emphasized meaningful, making meaningful time. Sister Joyce Jones says, not going around the same people or doing the same thing in our life. Um, but I want to go back up to Sister Laverne's point. I want to touch on that a little bit. And if she's out there, I want to get some clarity because she says, don't let the light get so bright that it blinds you. Um, and again, I think that's a nugget. So I'm, I'm writing that nugget down. So we know Aunt Laverne or Sister Laverne is relatively quiet, but Sister Laverne, if you could come off mute, can you give us an understanding on don't let the light get so bright that it blinds you? I didn't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it did just mean that you said, all right, this is a church ordinance, not the word of God. I can do this or that. But you find yourself... Uh, the example used was Christmas. You go to the Christmas dinner at your parents' house and then maybe you find yourself doing other little things pertaining to Christmas that you wouldn't normally do because you say, I know it's not Christ's birthday, so I'm not celebrating the birthday. And, but you get more and more into what the other person is doing because you put yourself in that situation. Oh, like somebody at the bar. You feel I got to go rescue my brother from the bar. I'm not going to drink, but I know now the church may say I can't go into a bar, but it's okay for me to go into the bar. I'm going to minister unto my brother. And you find yourself sitting there and maybe first time or two, you just sitting there talking. You go back again and then you, well, church said I can't have a glass of wine, but the Bible doesn't say that. So I'm going to have a glass of wine. You know, you find yourself getting deeper and deeper into the other situation instead of pulling the other person out, you're finding yourself falling deeper in. 
because that little light that got bright for you that said it was okay for you to go to this place or to do this, you finally was overtaken by it. You didn't, you weren't careful enough to, weren't strong enough to not be taken in and now you're doing what they are doing. That, that, that's that's kind of what I meant. Okay. And, and, and that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and I, but let me say, that's why this statement, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that the <coughs> president said earlier, it would take a Bible discussion to get to, because that, that is so true. Mm -hmm. Don't allow freedom to become an occasion to cause your fall. That's right. That's See, that, that's what that's the thing we have to recognize. The, the, and the thing is, people were held to a certain place to keep everybody safe. And the ones you're trying to, you thought you were keeping from something, they, they weren't going to, they would do what want to do anyhow. But my point I, I was making is that I have to know me. I have to know my limitations. I have to know what where I can go and what I'm going to be affected by. Is that is there is a propensity for me to engage in certain things that I, then I've gone too far? Yeah, right. yeah. yeah and I appreciate that. And I, and I think um, <laughs> Sister Rhonda says, this one's a slippery slope, which is true. Uh, Brenda puts it, this might be a Bible study for next week. And then Sister Monica, don't allow it to cause you to sin. And I think that's the point. Um, you know, it's it's just like when you look at I, it, it, when you look in the scripture, it says, "Can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burnt?" And I think we got to be very mindful of that. And Apostle, to your point, uh, I know my own proclivities. I know the things that I could be drawn away with. So I've got to be very mindful of those things. So as we look at this scripture, I want to I want to just ask the question. And if you haven't done it today, I would ask you to go through the scriptures and think about times in the scriptures where the disciples suffered for following and preaching the gospel. Uh, and the reason I want us to do that, in the United States, we really don't suffer for the faith. Um, our faith is actually, uh, and sometimes we can actually take it for granted that, you know what, I'm, I'm free in this country today to keep the Sabbath. Um, I'm free in this country to disagree with other religions or have a different viewpoint. In other countries, they can't preach the name of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and again, as I think about this thing of Christ being preeminent and being paramount, I do believe there's going to be, become a time in this country where our view on Jesus Christ will not be the dominant view. I believe there will come a time where we as believers will have to be positioned to defend the faith and even potentially die for the faith, because that's what Peter was really saying. In the early church, they were dying for the faith. It wasn't like, uh, we're just going to kick you out of the town. They were being killed. They were being crucified. They were being locked in jail. And so I would just ask you, as we finish up Sabbath school, just go through the scripture and look at some times that um, the, the disciples or the early apostles really had to be persecuted for their faith. And I just want to give one example because I think it stands out really well. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is not in the Sabbath school uh, notes, but it's just something I was just thinking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and beginning at verse 23. So this is what the apostle Paul writes, he says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labor, more abundant and stripes above measures and prison more frequent in death oft. Of the Jews five times, I received 40 stripes, save one. Three times was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day, I have been in the deep. And journeyings off in pearls of water and pearls of robbers and pearls by my own countrymen and pearls by the heathen and pearls in cities and pearls in the wilderness and pearls in the sea and pearls among false brethren and weariness and painfulness and watching often and hunger and thirst and fasting often and cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without that which cometh unto me daily, the care of all the churches. 
And I think when we think about the example of Christ being paramount and preeminent, that's just a great example of everything that the Apostle Paul went through. Why? Because he was preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. Uh, so I've got one more scripture I wanted us to go through. And then we're going to wrap up Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 through 27. And I've got a question that I want to have some discussion with on the Sabbath school. So Hebrews chapter 11, we know this is the hall of faith scripture. And it's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 through 27. And it says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. And so I just want to leave us with this. So I wrote this question down. It says in verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. So apostle, I wrote this question down and I wanted us to have some conversation because we think of everything Moses gave up. And I just thought about this as a teacher. Um, what are your thoughts that Moses gave up so much and he still didn't make it to the promised land? Oh, but he did. Okay. And you, the point you bring up is good. I, I, I saw your question. He did not make it to the land of promise, but he made it to the promised land. Okay. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? The thing is this about Moses. But Moses could have lived fun up until through his um, childhood, juvenile years, up to a young man. Moses lived an elaborate life because Egypt was, was rich. They had, they had it all. And because Pharaoh's daughter chose him to be her son, you know, we know the history of, you know, how he came to be her son. But he made a choice. It wasn't so much a choice. It was the call of God on his life. Mm -hmm. Because it was a call of God on his life, he gave up all of that. He even endured the afflictions of leading the children of Israel um, out of Egypt to the land of Canaan, 40 years in the wilderness, and all these things. that He, he endured that. But he, when they got to the land of promise, which was Canaan, Canaan was the land of, land of promise for that group of people for that day. Mm -hmm. God took him to the edge of the uh, of Canaan. Look over, Moses. I want you to know that what I told you was true. That's the land. But I'm not going to let you go over into that land. But we find in later scriptures that the, the Satan uh, and the angels fought over Moses' body. Right. So why would they be fighting over Moses' body if he wanted to make it to the promised land? See, that's, that's the thing I was, I was saying. He made it he made it with the eternal promise. He just didn't make it to that land that flowed with milk and honey in that day. Yeah. Apostle, I love that. And I just want to share this because I wrote that question down. And then I just began to think about there are times if you look at the story of Moses and we look at where uh, God actually buried Moses himself. Um, he showed Moses the promised land, but go to Matthew chapter 17. And I think this is the thing that I, I think about how awesome God is that you read the old Testament and you're like, man, it, it just doesn't seem like that was right. That Moses did all these things and still didn't get to see the promised land. Uh, but then I was studying the scripture and I said, man, look at how awesome God is. So Matthew chapter 17, uh, beginning at verse one, and it says, and after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into the high mountain apart. And he was transfigured or transformed before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered right. Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? 
if thou will let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. So as I was studying that, I said, you know what? We think he didn't make it to the promised land, but apostle, you said it. he did make it to the land of promise. And right here is Jesus is transfigured. Who's there talking with Jesus? Moses. And, and I think about this scripture where it says, choosing rather to suffer afflictions with God's people. If we suffer for Christ, the scripture says we're going to reign with him. And, and, and that's the thing I would say for us as believers, as we make a choice to obey God's word, as we make a choice to live a life pleasing to Christ, we can be like Peter. Well, I left it all. And, and Jesus is going to say, you know what? Uh, you may have left everything, but you know, you're going to have manifold blessings now and eternal life to come. You could be like Moses and say, man, I'm choosing to follow God's people than the pleasures of this world. You will never give up more for God than God will give up for, for us because he's given us his best in his son, Jesus Christ. And I just encourage the saints as we think about this lesson, how can I continue to make Christ number one in my life in the, in the world that we live in today? So just wanted to share those thoughts with the Sabbath school and I want to open it up. Any comments, questions, or thoughts from the Sabbath school? Brother John been trying to make a statement. Um, I'm sorry, Brother John. Go right ahead. That's okay. I just I was going to say you can find many places in the scripture where it, it says that there's a affliction of the gospel. And you see those examples in the lives that all the disciples lived. And like you said, that. If you suffer with Christ, you reign with him. But we're actually called to suffer. That's right. Yeah. But, yeah. I study on that once the afflictions of the gospel are filled up two pages with all the references. Of, but uh, and it's not really talked about much. But you have to realize that that's where it can become an offense, a rock of offense, if you're not prepared for that. You can get offended with the Lord, which is not a good place to be. Mm. That's good, Brother John. Thank you for that. That's a good point. Great point. What this lesson is, is showing us is that when we say Christ has preeminence in my life, it just can't be a multitude of words. It has to be something that we are saying and we mean it to the point that whatever comes, Whatever go, Christ still gonna be first. He's gonna be the, the the lead, the head of my life, and I have to treat it that even when it comes to family, I still have to know that I made him. I made Christ a choice in my life. He drew me to him. I accepted the call, and now he has preeminence. You know, the King has preeminence in, in my life, and that that has to be each one of our testimonies, Amen. because people are gonna question your why of it. You know, you're talking about earlier um, when, when Jesus was talking to those that end up wanting to throw him off the cliff, you know. But he said, look, this is the way it is. Uh, Christ has to be that in your life. No matter what people want to do, no matter what they say, you have to know. And that's where I think part of the salvation, salvation being an individual journey. Mm -hmm. It's individual. You know, um, mom, dad, Sister, brother, husband, wife, nobody can take you past death but Christ. Right. And the only way he can do that only is because you, you gave up everything for him. Amen. Amen. Apostle, I think you bring up a great point. And as we wrap up this Sabbath school lesson, I just encourage the saints. Um, the scripture says, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. So our soul yeah. salvation with fear yeah. And trembling, and if it were possible, the enemy would deceive God's very elect. So we just have to be mindful as we study the scripture, as we study the word of God, that God would just gird us up in his word, uh, that he would continue to strengthen us to be obedient to his word and do the things he's commanded us to do. I'm grateful for God and everything that he's done. I'm grateful for your participation in the Sabbath school lesson. And I, my prayer is that God would be preeminent in our life. Um, there's a lot of things, especially in the world today, that can distract us from having a relationship with God. My prayer, especially as we go navigate through COVID-19, 
that God would continue to guard our hearts and our minds, that he would continue to keep us, that we would continue to put him first and do the things that he's commanded us to do. So I thank God for the Sabbath school. We want to open it up before we close. Are there any comments, any questions from the Sabbath school? I have a comment that, um, you know, as I listen to the things that are being said, um, the word law resonates um, with me concerning, because I think you asked the question about how do I know that I'm following him? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I think that's shown in, in the way I love him. And in the way I love him in return, it's also shown in the way I love you. Whether or not am I following you? Am I following God the way I should? Because that, that's a really that's a that's an indicator to show because if I say I love God, it's gonna it's gonna generate obedience to him and the things he say. And I just can't have a love packed all up wrapped with a bowl with God and don't like you. That's <laughs> no, 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 no. That that doesn't work that way. That's right. Um, when I say I love God and want to do the things of the Lord, mm -hmm. oh my God, you are very much part of that process. That's so right. I wanted to share that. Yeah, St. Charmaine, and I think if, if we haven't highlighted um John chapter 13, 34, and 35, I believe as believers, this should be paramount for us. I mean, Jesus says this. He said, a new commandment I give unto you. And you know we big on the commandments. Right. This is what he says. <laughs> I'm giving you a new commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And then he says, by this shall all men know that you are my what? Disciples. My disciples. And remember, we said disciple was a pupil. It's a student. Jesus talked about if you didn't do these things, you couldn't be a disciple. But right here, he says, this is how they're going to know you're my disciple. If you have love one for another. So I think that's a great way to close our Sabbath school lesson is that, guess what? If he's preeminent, I've got to demonstrate, not just with my lips, that yeah. I love him. But I got to demonstrate it that I love not only him, but his love is going to allow me to also love everybody. So appreciate the Sabbath school. Appreciate your engagement. I'm going to turn it back into the hands of our superintendent for the furtherance of our Sabbath school. God bless you, saints. Amen. We do honor God. We thank him for the Sabbath school this morning. We thank the Lord because once again, um, his word is proven that it certainly will come in and, and clean us up and it refines yeah. us and it rebukes us yeah. and makes us happy. It makes us sad. It's the word of God that does all these things for us. And at the end of the day, it's God's love towards us um, to make us better in him. So thank you, Deacon Preston, for teaching Apostle. Uh, thank you all so much how the Lord just um, showers you with his anointing that we can learn, um, get understanding of his word. And we thank God for that. We don't want to take that for granted because not everybody, every church you go to, that you learn the word of God, that, the, that you get an understanding like that. So we appreciate God. We thank him for that. I, I really do. I thank God for it. So um, I think it's no more said or done in the Sabbath school. Thank you for attending. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules. For those that joined in with us today um, for our Sabbath school, and we're going to turn Great. it into the hands of our apostle. I thank you, Sister Charmaine, um, Deacon Preston, spend the job today with the Sabbath school lesson for you, the saints in attendance of Sabbath school, for those who have joined us on Zoom, for those who join us on Facebook Live, and even after this is over, it's posted on um YouTube, so some of you join us later, uh, in that endeavor to get the word out, get the word out to the people that they will uh, understand what God's word really is saying to us. We know everybody is saying we have the truth, we have the truth, but it's my endeavor uh, as we come before the Lord that we would uh, search the scriptures to make sure that we are presenting the truths of God. Uh, I said this morning before uh, we started, Deacon Preston and other sisters, I may echo this prior to me, 
Uh, let's keep our sister Zelda and her family in prayer on the loss of her son, uh, BJ, Brother James Horsley. Let's keep her, keep, this is devastating. Some of y'all have experienced loss on that magnitude also. So, you know, the, the severity of the loss, keep her and her family in prayer. Um, again, respect her time right now. She said, give her a couple of days before the saints contact her. Um, um, she said, I just want my phone blowing up right now. I just need some time to myself. So she'll be ready to talk with the saints in a couple of days. And, and as arrangements are made uh, for his phone, phone services and whatnot, we would get that out to the saints. God bless you. Be back with us at one o'clock uh, for afternoon worship. It is the Sabbath in all your dwelling. So with that being said, God bless you and be back with us shortly. Amen. Amen.